Okay, welcome everybody. I'm John Cavana from the Institute for Policy Studies, and we want to welcome you all here at IPS and online to this event to lift up and celebrate and discuss the new book by Jerry Epstein, uh, which is Busting the Bankers Club. Um, Jerry is part of a longtime ally of IPS um, at the University of Massachusetts, the Political Economy Research Institute. Um, for our online participants, just buy the book. You know, go to your favorite bookstore, not, not that big one, but your favorite bookstore and buy it. And uh, there's copies available here afterwards for people uh, um, who are here in person. Uh, I want to say it's my Great pleasure to be here with people from four institutions that work tirelessly to make the economy work for people. First, I want to thank my colleagues from the Institute for Policy Studies here who do brilliant research and other work with social movements. And I've dug back into our archives uh, to show you that IPS first started working on banking and finance in 1980. <laughs> where we pulled together then Prime Minister of Jamaica, Michael Manley, and then Prime Minister of Tanzania, Julius Nairi, uh, in a um, gathering around uh, proposals for a new international monetary system and new international economic order. And it's, it's all in this, great, uh, in this great dialogue. And then by 1985, we'd started something called the Debt Crisis Network. And, worked with people around the US, but also in Latin America who were fighting against the US banks and trying to get them to forgive some of the international debt. So we've been in this for a while. I also wanna thank our co-host, Public Citizen, fearlessly led by Rob Weissman. Um, their motto is corporations have their lobbyists, the people need advocates too, that's where we come in. They're great. Uh, Better Markets, which is here, working to build a more secure financial system for all Americans. Check them out. And finally, Americans for Financial Reform, working to lay the foundation for a strong, stable, and ethical financial system. And it's my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of Americans for Financial Reform, Lisa Donner, who will introduce our speaker, author, and moderate the discussion. Buy the book. Uh, Lisa. Thank you, John, and thanks to IPS for hosting us and to all the other co-sponsors for doing this uh, together and to IPS as well for uh, their fabulous work uh, over the years. Uh, it is a particular pleasure to get to work with Sarah um, Anderson on executive compensation issues, but that's, that is not the only pleasure, so thank you. Um, and it's a great pleasure to get to introduce Jerry, um, who is, as John said, a professor of economics in a, at UMass Amherst and a founding co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute of Cary there. Um, he has written a whole bunch of important books on economic policy, especially about central banking, international finance, including, of course, the book, and I will do this one more time, we are about to talk about uh, today, uh, Busting the Bankers Club, Finance for the Rest of Us. Uh, but also a book on central banking uh, and a book on modern monetary theory. Um, and uh, I'll add that in addition to his academic work, he is a longtime member of the Center for Popular Economics. I feel particularly grateful for Jerry's scholarship and his clear eye on financialization, including both the economic and the political and power dynamics at play. It's an area where, as he notes, there is generally not enough attention. So his analysis is particularly needed and particularly welcome. If you go looking for work in this space, you think there's not enough, but you quickly come around to Jerry <laughs> doing valuable things. Um, also grateful for his engagement with um, and contributions to advocacy. We so much need and have so often depended on his expertise and the expertise of the colleagues that he's pulled together. It was really crucial in thinking through responses to the financial crisis in 2008 and beyond, and it remains crucial now. Um, and one of my not so secret hopes from this conversation and like the occasion of talking about this book uh, is that it helps us kick off a new round of heightened academic advocacy collaboration. So thank you and over to you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, John, very much. Um, and like 
uh, like you, I want to thank uh, everybody who's here today and out there in cyberspace uh, to hear about my new book. And I especially want to thank uh, John Cavana for organizing this and all the people here at IPS and the other co-sponsors, uh, Lisa and Americans for Financial Reform, Dennis and Better Markets um, and uh, Public Citizen and um, also Economic Policy Institute has, has helped to promote this. And finally, I want to thank Kim Weinstein of Perry Political Economy Research Institute, who did a great job of also trying to um, advertise this event. So Busting the Bankers Club, uh, Finance for the Rest of Us is the full title, uh, is about the outsized power of finance in the United States, economically and politically. I ask, how does this finance industry, especially the mega banks like JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, you name them, how do they sustain their economic and political power and the huge incomes of their CEOs and investors despite threatening major financial crises every decade or so, while demanding government bailouts on a frequent basis. Now, some argue that these financial titans are so big and so powerful because they provide such valuable services to our economy. In other words, that these bankers are essential workers. But busting the banker club shows that these mega banks, private e equity firms, hedge funds, are actually on balance a net drain on our economy. This is because of their misallocation of financial resources, the frequent financial crises that they cause, and the outsized profits and incomes that they extract from society. By the way, this particular analysis and a lot of the underlying research in my book comes from my joint research with graduate students from the University of Massachusetts Amherst Economics Department. And in particular, that particular research I did with my a former graduate student, Juan Montesino, who's sitting in the back over there, who's now a professor of economics at American University here in Washington. <clears throat> so how do these financiers sustain their power and wealth? My answer is that it's the Bankers Club, the powerful group of allies that bankers cultivate and motivate to promote the interests of finance in Washington, state capitals, and around the country. My book details these club members and shows how and why they promote the power of finance. My, my book shows that these um, club members uh, do this at a price, and I'll explain that in a minute. Note how important this club is to the bankers. Survey after survey shows how unpopular big banks are to Americans. Every year I challenge my undergraduate students to come up with a Hollywood movie that portrays bankers in a positive light. And the closest they get is, it's a wonderful life. And that's from 1946. Now the Bankers Club includes some regular suspects, the big banks and financial institutions, the politicians, they pay off to protect them, to write helpful legislation and appoint finance friendly regulators. But there are other members who might be more surprising. Take for instance, the Federal Reserve. I call the Federal Reserve the chairman of the club. The Fed sees the world through finance colored glasses with its monetary policy tools, its regulations and the lender of last resort actions. The Fed often puts the interests of finance ahead of those society, ahead of those of society at large. We saw this with the no strings attached financial bailouts after the great financial crisis of 2007, 2009 and we have seen this bias again in its recent high interest rate policies that's maintained high interest rates for way too long. Now, other key members of the club, club include many financial regulatory agencies and lawyers that work for them. Then there's the CEOs of non-financial corporations who often side with the banks, which by the way, and I'll talk about this in a little bit later, differs from what happened in the Great Depression when many non-financial corporations sided with FDR and the New Deal regulatory changes. And then there are all too many in my own profession, economists who fashion theories based on flimsy assumptions that rationalize financial deregulation 
while claiming that free markets are the best of all possible worlds. This club, at the cost of millions of dollars, dismantled the New Deal financial regulations that were the foundation of a relatively stable and efficient financial system that we had following the Second World War, though it was highly discriminatory. Some called this system boring banking, and this deregulation uh, that, they, that they financed ushered in our current system of what I call roaring banking, mega banks that crash our economy or threaten to do so on a regular basis. By the way, in 2009, Public Citizen, one of the co-sponsors of this event, write a terrific report, sold out how Wall Street and Washington betrayed America, where they detailed a lot of these feet of lobbying fees that the big banks paid. And so it continues. Just a year ago, roaring banks threatened the stability of our financial system once again with the breakdown of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and crypto-friendly Silvergate Bank, while lobbyists and some politicians are pressing forward every day to bring dangerous crypto assets still closer to the core of our financial system. Now, Busting the Bankers Club tells this story on two tracks, a historical narrative that runs from the Great Depression and the New Deal to the Great Financial Crisis and Dodd-Frank, all the way to the present with SVB and cryptocurrencies. The second track is an analytical one. It discusses the structure of the Bankers Club and describes the underlying macroeconomic and financial dynamics that it creates. Importantly, busting the Bankers Club is not just about the Bankers Club and the problems it creates. My book is also about the club busters, the individuals, the organizations, and the groups that for years have been fighting for a better financial system. In fact, this room is filled with club busters. And one of the aspects of the book that I am happiest about is that it portrays their work and even often uses the words of some of those here and in other organizations who are fighting for a more efficient, more equitable, and more effective financial system. These club busters include, of course, the Americans for Financial Reform, who were central to the fight over Dodd-Frank financial reform and have continued since then to struggle for, for for a better financial system for all of us. Better Markets, which under Dennis Kelleher's leadership, has engaged in fight after fight to protect the victories of Dodd-Frank and to reform the financial system further. Public Citizen, that has highlighted and tried to end corruption in the financial system. And IPS, I'd forgotten about the earlier work, John, but I'm thinking especially of the important work over many years by Sarah Anderson and Chuck Collins on the ways in which corporations, including those in the financial system, contribute to massive income and wealth inequality. And importantly, they also identify alternative tax and other policies to reverse this inequality and injustice. Now, many of these club busters were very generous with their time in giving me interviews for my book. They talked to me about their analyses of the financial system and prospects for change as well as about the work of their own organizations. I could not have written this book, literally, I could not have written this book without their contributions. Now, I think it was Dennis Kelleher who told me that Wall Street thrives in the dark. My main goal in writing Busting the Bankers Club has been to shine a spotlight on these problematic financial institutions and markets, as well as on the activists and institutions that are fighting them and trying to reform finance. To do this, I've tried to explain confusing terms like the alphabet soup of financial products that were implicated in the great financial crisis, like CDO, CDSs, CDO squared, and to lay bare for students and non-experts the underlying economic dynamics that drive the financial system and these power relations. At the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, I've taught an undergraduate class called Finance and Society for about 10 years, where I've tried out these lessons. My students have been good guinea pigs. I now give them a free book in compensation. Lucky, lucky them. <laughs> now, among the questions I try to answer in the book is this. What holds the Bankers Club together? 
Well, it's a nexus of payoffs. Financial institutions give campaign contributions to politicians and off offers them and their staffs lucrative jobs when they leave office. Financial firms hire economic consultants, sometimes give money to friendly economics to programs and economics departments. And the banks create a revolving door of well-paying jobs for Federal Reserve and regulatory officials and their staffs who shuttle between private and public em and em employment. Now, none of this will surprise most of you, but it does surprise my students. How is all this finance? To what I call the circuit of wealth grabbing. To some extent, this is a self-sustaining process where the banker's club is paid off from the profits financial institutions make from deregulation and favorable tax treatment. So the money goes around. But undergirding much of this is what I call the money spigot. This includes, very importantly, government and Federal Reserve bailouts. Federal Reserve liquidity provision and friendly monetary policy that enhances financial profits and sustains the real value of financial assets. So for example, the recent major increase in interest rates by the Federal Reserve was an attempt to enhance uh, financial profits, sustain the real wealth of their financial assets, but at the cost of uh, throwing some workers out of work and raising costs of home ownership and other important goods for, for most, most of the rest of us. Underlying this circuit further is the government sanctioned private bank based monetary system that allows private banks to create money. This is what we always teach our students in money and banking. It always seems like magic. And to some extent, it is like magic, except that it comes about as a result of the charters that our government gives uh, to banks. It allows them to create money. Now, in principle, for this privilege, the government should require the, that these banks act much more in the public interest. But in practice, the mega banker, the mega bankers usually just take the money and run. Now, to reform banking, we must reduce the power of the bankers club. And to do that, we must, among other things, plug up this money spigot. I'll return to this point towards the end. Now, I don't have time here to discuss all the members or groups that make up the bankers club. In the book, I have chapters on lobbyists and politicians, the Federal Reserve, chairman of the club, financial regulators and their lawyers, non-financial corporations, and economists. I'll just mention a couple of them here. I'll start with a mystery about non-financial corporations, including automakers, steel companies, general appliance and durable goods manufacturers like General Electric. The puzzle is this. As I alluded to earlier, <clears throat> In the second chapter of Busting the Bankers Club, it, we, I recount the history of the Great Depression of the 1930s and the passage of the New Deal financial reform by the FDR's administration, including the famous Glass-Steagall Act that separated commercial and in investment banking. I described how many industrial companies tired of this massive depression and all the income and, and profits that it cost them decided to link up with FDR and supported some of these financial reforms. So rather than siding with the banks, these companies sided uh, with the reformers. However, fast forward 75 years in the battle over Dodd-Frank, and we find that the major non-financial corporations sided with the banks, with the mega banks against the reformers. What explains these different policies? between the Great Depression and now. One explanation is based on what sociologists and some economists call, and Lisa alluded to this, financialization. The ubiquity and even dominance of financial motives, markets, and institutions throughout our economy. <clears throat> According to this view, financialization, non-financial corporations get a lot of their income, a lot of their profits from financial activities, not from making stuff. It's because of this, according to the theory, that they align themselves politically with the banks. Now, though this view has some merit, um, 
I, I, I'm not sure that it's the full explanation. I, I argue that there's another type of financialization going on here. I call it the financialization of the CEO. As Sarah Anderson, Chuck Collins, and others have shown, the CEOs and top management of major corporations, including non-financial corporations, have accumulated massive amounts of wealth. We all know this. They want asset managers and bankers to invest this wealth. They want tax lawyers and accountants to hide it in tax havens and politicians to maximize tax loopholes so they can keep doing it more. The last thing these, these CEOs of non-financial corporations want is financial regulation to limit their investment options or reduce their tax loopholes. So the last thing they want is tight financial regulation. I would even suggest that many of these CEOs uh, wouldn't, but wouldn't want better regulation, even if they thought it would enhance the profitability of their corporations, because their personal wealth portfolios are more important to them than the corporations they manage. <clears throat> this unified power between finance and non-financial uh, CEOs um, and, and the wealthy 1% is a big challenge for us. In the Great Depression, FDR used this division between them to help get through the reforms. Now it's harder for us because they are more unified. I will also mention a second set of members of the Bankers Club, the economists. After all, I am one of them. One of my goals in writing the book is to tr try to convince more economists to join the club busters. This is one of Lisa's goals as well. I first point out the myriad ways in which too many in my profession are deliberate or accidental members of the Bankers Club. They practice what I call Bankers Club economics. Some have won Nobel Prizes by developing, and many have taught and writ written textbooks full of fairy tales about the social efficiency of financial markets and promoting the false claim uh, about the costly dangers of financial regulations. Other prominent economists have used their university affiliations to bolster their credentials, claiming to be objective academics, while publicly discussing financial reform issues. At the same time though, they have undisclosed lucrative associations with financial institutions. As my former graduate student, Jessica Carrick -Hog Hogenbarth and I showed several years ago. But thankfully, there are many club busters among us economists as well. A number of them are in this room or perhaps online. Economists who work with AFR, Better Markets, EPI, CIFR, and other terrific organizations, and in some university departments, such as American University, UMass, New School, and others. But still, too few progressive economists have taken it upon themselves to really get involved in the analytical work needed to support those fighting on the front lines for financial reform. So I do hope, as Lisa said, that my book will inspire some more economists to sign on. Now, the last section of my book addresses financial reform. First, the first chapter in this section discusses financial regulation. In this chapter, I draw on the work of AFR, Better Markets, CEPR, um, political champions like Elizabeth Warren, Jared Brown, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and others. Here, I try to outline a program of financial regulation that will not only bring about a less crisis prone and more equitable financial system, but one that will help promote solutions to major problems we face, such as making the green transition, providing affordable housing and economic development, and protect the interests of working people and vulnerable, vulnerable populations from the ravages of private equity firms. Very briefly, I argue for one, a comp comprehensive regulation of all major uh, financial institutions and markets. Two, a new Glass-Steagall Act to try to break up the mega banks, cutting them down to size. Three, strict capital leverage and liquidity requirements to make all these institutions and markets safer and to create incentives uh, for those running these firms uh, to do likewise. 
And finally, a precautionary principle set of regulations and licensing. So new financial products like crypto assets cannot infect the rest of the financial system unless they're proven to be safe and effective. Since my time is limited, I'll spend my last few minutes though talking about something that's garnered less attention. In the penultimate chapter of my book, I argue that private financial, excuse me, the better financial regulation will not be enough to make our financial system work for us all. A strictly private for-profit financial system, no matter how well regulated, has too narrow a focus to tackle many of the problems we face, such as climate change, inequality, and community economic development. In addition, I argue, we need a vital system of publicly oriented financial institutions, what I call banks without bankers. Public banks, a significant net network of community development financial institutions with social missions and thriving community banks. As some of you might know, there are active public banking organizations in many parts of our country. At least 22 states have groups that are attempting to start public banks. The most successful by far um, are in California, where in 2019, laws were passed paving the way for local and municipal public banks. In my own state of Massachusetts, there's an excellent bill being tabled in the state legislature by the Massachusetts Public Banking Organization. Still, these smaller initiatives will need to be brought up to scale to make a national difference. These institutions have to be big enough and widespread enough to give us alternatives to the for-profit mega financial institutions. So we also need larger, more publicly oriented banks such as green banks, community redevelopment banks, and perhaps most importantly, we need a more publicly oriented central bank. In that regard, we won't get a thriving ecosystem of publicly oriented banks until we have a Federal Reserve that supports public banking with the same gusto and even a small fraction of the support that it gives to the private roaring banking system. So along those lines, I support the Public Banking Act introduced by Congresswomen Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib and Americans for Financial Reform, I think worked with them as well. This bill will establish a robust regulatory framework, financial infrastructure, and grants program to support public banking. It will also create a public banking liquidity facility so that public banks can thrive and grow. Now, the need for a vibrant set of publicly oriented financial institutions arises from the need to have an alternative to the mega banks. But this also speaks to the double entendre of the title of my book, The Bankers Club. The club is not only the bank, bank's political allies, which I've been talking about, the club is also the club that the banks hold over our heads, where they say, if you regulate us too much or tax us too much or aren't, don't bail us out enough, we're gonna take our money and run. We're gonna move to London, we're gonna move to Frankfurt, we're gonna to move to Shanghai. This is the threat, the club that they hold over our heads. Now, the first answer to that is what I said towards the beginning in my work with Juan, showed that these banks are a net drain on our economy. They don't really contribute that much to our economy relative to a well-organized banking system. But second of all, we have to have alternative financial institutions that we can turn to to provide the services that we need if, if the big banks do pick up and leave. So if we have an ecosystem of publicly oriented financial institutions that can provide the services the need, that we need, so we can say to the banks when they threaten to leave, well, goodbye and good riddance. Now in the last chapter of the book, and this is the last point I'm gonna make, I step back and try to address a serious catch 22 a chicken and egg problem that lies at the core of my book. My book argues that the Bankers Club is extremely powerful, yet I'm in proposing um, uh, an ambitious set of changes and reforms 
that the club will certainly try to block. How do we break this, this Gordian knot? Well, first I, I, I point out, especially to my fellow economists, busting the bankers club has to be done in such a way that's not typically the way economists talk about it. Economists like to promote reforms that will help out some people without hurting anybody else. We economists call these Pareto optimal improvements. But I, but I argued in my book that to bring about financial reforms, we will re need to reduce the power of the banks. In order to do that, we have to win reforms that will actually reduce the bank's profits, reduce the bank's income. We need to do that so we have to close off the money spigot. They'll have less income, less money to pay uh, the, uh, for the economists and the lawyers and the politicians who support them. So Pareto optimal reforms is not what I'm proposing. I'm purport, proposing reforms that will actually harm the banks, reduce their political power, and make more room for the rest of us. Second, we have to, of course, promote democracy at, the, at, at, the, at large. I'm arguing for a more democratic financial system, but this is we have to have a, a more democratic system broadly to cut off the role of money in politics and to um, make our political system more democratic. <clears throat> Finally, and this is the last point, more of us, economists, lawyers, small business owners, small banking officials, students, et cetera, we need to join the club busters. This is the message I try to convey in my book, join the club busters. I say that at the end of every talk I give. And I hope it wins over at least a, fruit, a few uh, recruits in the process. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, good. Actually, also, if you can say it to people, they can't really hear you too well. Okay. We can actually unlike mute people here. They can ask verbally. We have one in the Q and A. So oh. if you want, actually, we have two. You can. If you want, I can also allow something. I can type it in the chat. You can say it to me. Okay. They can come off mute. I can give them if they raise their hand. I can allow them to speak. Great. Well, we can do, I think, whatever you prefer and folks watching online prefer in terms of speaking or writing their questions. And I will try to repeat them so people can hear. Should we, is there a question in the room to start with or should we start online? Go ahead, Sarah, and then we'll, then we'll turn on, then we'll go online. Thank you, Jerry. I thought that was a really helpful. Sorry. Are, are you, or, one more second. Yeah, if you could speak up, then everybody can hear yeah. you online too. I thought that was a re it's a really helpful framework for understanding the, the landscape and breaking it down into different pieces. I, I think I wanted to raise two things. One is I've been writing about the 2008 crash a bit recently and realizing I'm writing for a lot, a lot of people who were children then. And some people might have the impression, well, we haven't had another you know, complete national disaster like that with millions of people losing their homes. So, you know, maybe we don't have that much need to, to take on the, the big mm -hmm. Wall Street banks. So I'm curious what your response is to that. And then in your um, part about public banking, I was wondering if you looked into the experience with postal banking at all and, and ideas around that as a way to both reinvigorate the postal service to meet modern needs, but also advance the idea of public banking for that. Um, yes, yeah, so about, about financial crashes. I think a lot of my students, when I talk to them about this, they, they don't realize that um, in March 2020, when the pandemic hit, that the global financial system almost melted down again, and that the Federal Reserve and the central banks in, uh, around the world had to put in another several trillion dollars uh, uh, to backstop that system. And then, of course, <clears throat> Most of them probably don't know about what happened last, just a year ago with, with the SVB and so forth. And that the Federal Reserve regularly subsidizes um, uh, the financial system to keep these mini crises from exploding into to mega crises. But the other point I'm, I, that I really try to make in, in the book is that it's not just a, an issue of yeah. financial crises that harm uh, everybody. It's the... Um, 
poor services, the lack of appropriate credit allocation and so forth, that the banks do on a regular basis. On a regular basis, common people can't get a lot of the financial services that they need. They can't get low cost checking and banking accounts. They can't get conflict free investment advice. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to start a small business, you can't get loans uh, easily to start a small business. If you live in a red, basically red line community, you can't get any financial services at all. So uh, this banking system that we have harms us on a regular basis, even if there weren't any, any financial crises. And so that's one of the points that I try to, 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 to get through. Think about um, what the private equity firms are doing. And, and I know AFR and Better Markets, among others, have written a lot about this. So it's not just the crises. It's, the, it's on a daily basis. In terms of postal banking, yes. Uh, the public banks that I talked about is a small aspect of the idea of a more uh, publicly oriented financial system. So uh, public banking, Fed accounts, um, ways to get low cost or cost free kinds of financial services um, are very much on the agenda, I think. Uh, of course, we have to update the postal banking service. Um, it ended in 1964. We had it, I think, from 1950 to 1964 or so. Now, um, with the new technology and so forth, we have to think of a way that we can make it uh, more, more integrated into um, the internet and, and electronic payments and that kind of thing. But I know people uh, are thinking a lot about that. Uh, so that's something that I often talk about with my students, the idea of Fed accounts at the Fed, where people can have low cost um, uh, or no cost as checking accounts and payment services, um, combined perhaps with postal banking services that would also help the US Postal Service. Maybe take one online. Yeah, one online and then we'll go back to the, yeah. Um, I listened, well, I wish you should have said it, but I listened to, um, maybe they can hear me. Uh, I listen to a lot of talks about progressive economists and mainstream financial advisors, and everyone's predicting um, another major banking crisis similar to 2008. Given this threat, in addition to other corporate uh, uh, malfeasance, why haven't progressives sought to draft a U.S. candidate who, will, who is willing to tackle this within the next four years? Wouldn't another banking crisis result in fascism in the U.S., even if Trump is not elected in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the short version. Okay, the, the short version of the question, uh, I think, included three parts. One, uh, a reference to conversation about uh, imminent banking crisis now. Uh, a second, uh, about what um, what an appropriate progressive response to that is um, in thinking about the upcoming presidential election. And a third, uh, maybe about uh, what the consequences, some of the consequences of a crisis might be. So, so do you want to you tackle any of these? I, I'm going to turn to you first. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have these major financial crises um, uh, just every so often. But as I just said in the answer to the previous question, there are always underlying problems that could break out into a major financial crisis. Uh, the Federal Reserve and the, and the Treasury, uh, both here in the US and abroad, have invested a lot of money to try to uh, uh, prevent these things from, from spreading. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not gonna pre predict a major financial crisis any, at any particular moment. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, I think the dissatisfaction with our financial system, the anger about the way it contributes to inequality, the poor services it provides, all the things that, that I was talking about earl earlier, does create a, a lot of dissatisfaction among, among the electorate. And I think one of the things that generated uh, this rightward move among uh, a number of our fellow citizens was the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, and the way in which the government, the mantra went, you know, bailed out the banks, but didn't bail out Main Street. And as long as people keep seeing this uh, on, a, on not only in terms of crises, but on a daily basis, I do think it makes people very angry. And some of those people do move to the right. 
So um, that's why I think the reforms that uh, America's financial reform, better markets that I propose in my book are very important for making the financial system serve the rest of us. That, so that people can see that the government and uh, more community oriented or smaller banks actually uh, provide services at a reasonable cost. And we'll pe people will begin to see that, it, uh, that the bank, the government is not always in bed uh, with the banks. And we have many politicians who play this role. Senator Elizabeth Warren, for example, um, Senator Sherrod Brown, Senator Jeff Merkley. There are many politicians who actually have been fighting against uh, these, these mega banks. And so uh, to the extent to which they uplift themselves and we uplift them, we, we show that there is another way. Uh, um, yeah, another way to, to what they've experienced. Thanks. The question in the room next. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, one of the questions, of course, I'm focused on other economists, so it's a question you've seen uh, elementary, but one of the things you mentioned, the players in the bigger club, is the Fed and their role in raising rates, right? So my understanding is that they raise rates to combat inflation. And inflation obviously hurts many people in <coughs> the communities or rising costs of goods, right? So are you insinuating that there are other ways to combat inflation? Because it seems like it's a lose-lose situation because you have to raise the rates to come to pull down inflation. Or if you don't raise rates, then many and millions of people in America will pay high goods and services for things that maybe a year ago wasn't as expensive. So I'm just trying to understand what are you insinuating that there's other ways to combat inflation or what what how can we get past this lose-lose scenario? So it's so I I I suggested at some point in my talk that the Federal Reserve raised rates as high as they did and kept it kept them up as high for as long as they did because they were trying to help the the financiers um, and um, weren't particularly trying to to help the rest of us. I, and you're saying, but look, you know, it, the big increases in the cost of living. Um, really did hurt a lot of, of, of people at all levels of the income and wealth distribution. And didn't the Fed have to raise interest rates in order to bring down the cost of living or stop the rise in the cost of living to, to help everybody? So the answer is it's a complicated situation. The, the, the inflation that we experienced was largely, though not entirely, a result of two factors. One were supply side shocks. The, the, um, disruption of supply chains as a result of the, of the COVID pandemic and as a result of the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, which disrupted food markets. Um, and uh, also uh, a result of mostly big co companies taking advantage of these shocks to increase their profits, so-called profit inflation. There was also some demand side inflation perhaps coming from um, the, the remnants of the fiscal policy that the government had uh, undertaken to help out uh, in, during the COVID crisis. But the other two were, were uh, the main causes. Now, raising interest rates is not a very effective tool for uh, um, Im Im implicating, the, for, for correcting the supply side problems. Uh, raising interest rates actually makes it more costly to produce supply. So it actually makes it, could make it worse. Um, and raising interest rates uh, helped at least some finance, some institutions raise uh, their interest rates by more than they needed to, enhance their profits by more than they needed to. So those weren't um, really tools designed to solve this particular kind of inflation. So what could the Fed have done? Well, um, the Fed needed to work in 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 tow with the, the government um, to help subsidize uh, people who were particularly hard hit by inflation by subsidizing food costs by subsidizing housing costs by subsidizing um, gasoline uh, costs when gasoline prices went up by so much. Uh, the Federal Reserve um, could have made um, low cost loans to institutions that were trying to supply these products and trying to increase the supply of these goods uh, for people. Uh, they could have imposed temporary wage and, and price controls as well, or particularly price controls on some of these products. We had price controls uh, in in um, the uh, earlier period in the 1970s, they can work 
for a short period of time. It's hard to have permanent controls without a whole apparatus, but short term they can work. So there were other things that the Federal Reserve could have done. It's, it's they're not the Fed's not used to doing this. They, they think they have one tool, the interest rates, and, and so they push that. But I think if they had been more creative and more understanding of what the the uh, causes of the inflation were and who the the uh, the people who are hurt by inflation, they could have done some other things rather than what they did. So Gregory Squires asked, Squires, what do you see as the role of special purpose credit programs, particularly in light of recent challenges to any race conscious policy following the Supreme Court's rejection of affirmative action admissions program at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. So there's a question about special purpose credit vehicles, uh, especially in light of some of the legal challenges to um, targeted programs like that. Uh, that's a great question. Um, just as an aside, uh, part of my book talks about the legal profession and including uh, the judiciary. And we, I talk a lot about um, you know, the, uh, the attempt to, to, by the right wing, to remold the judiciary and law schools, the law and economics movement and so forth, um, in, in such a way that they've really reshaped uh, the way that the, the legal system is operating. And this is one of the terrible um, impacts of, of this. So this whole group is now I'm definitely part of the what I call the bankers club. So clearly, we need to figure out some ways to, to compensate from, from previous oppression, previous harms, um, uh, the lack of a level playing field for, for people of color in our economy. So anything that we can design, I'm not a lawyer, we do have some lawyers here, anything that we can design to get around these really terrible rulings, I think we have to push and push as hard as we can, including uh, these kinds of vehicles. But I'm not an expert, so I can't tell you exactly how to design uh, the, the, the law. There may be people in the room who could, but um, we just have to keep pushing against against these rulings until we can get a better judiciary in, uh, in place. Sure. Um, yeah, a beautiful framework. And thanks for lifting up the club busters um, and inviting people to join. You might, <laughs> Lisa, at a certain moment, give the, like, the password and the secret handshake and so on <laughs> uh, for this. But just a quick question. You ended with that very nice aside about public banking and it's a centerpiece of your work. I don't, I'm sure you get into this in the book, but but the, there's a mythology around the state that did this first, North Dakota. And I wonder, I mean, you didn't mention it. Is that because you don't like the North Dakota public bank or is it a good story? Should it be lifted up more to show people that not only it can work, but it's been working somewhere for decades and decades and decades? Yeah, so there's uh, positive aspects of the, of the North Dakota story and some some um, so, some things to, to, to be concerned about. Wait, I, I have a technical. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, the only state bank that we currently have in the United States is is the State Bank of North Dakota, that which which was created in uh, um, 1909, I believe, and it was part. It was an outgrowth of the populist movement in the late 19th century, the agrarian, the agrarian revolt of the early 20th century, and a, a, a very uh, a, a populist um, militant group formed to, tr to try to alter the financial system in North Dakota to work better for the farmers and the workers and so forth. Out of this movement finally came the, the State Bank of North Dakota. And it was kind of a pared down from the general movement. They wanted to democratize the whole financial system and so forth, but they got this. Um, and this bank had a particular model called partnership banking. The Bank of North Dakota does not take deposits and it does not lend directly to final customers. What it does is it uses uh, state funds that they deposit with the bank and some initial capital, <coughs> excuse me, and they lend to, to community and small uh, financial institutions that then on lend uh, this, this money to final customers, 
workers, the co-ops, farmers, et cetera, at a, 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 a subsidized rate. Now, this has several advantages. First of all, it's the local uh, banks and so forth who really know their customers. So they can do the due diligence and figure out you know, who's a good credit risk and, and so forth. And, and also it cuts down on costs that, these, uh, that the Bank of North Dakota faces. The downside, however, um, is that the bank is very limited in what it can do. It can't make big loans uh, to uh, big initiatives on its own. Um, and it does this largely in order to reduce pushback from the bankers club. It doesn't want to have political opposition uh, from the local banks who would otherwise scream and yell about it. Um, it makes these smaller banks though allies of, of the Bank of North Dakota. Now, many of, this, of the current initiatives, in, the one in Massachusetts and several of the others use this same approach, the partnership bank approach, largely for the same reasons. They're trying to assuage the possible opposition from the private banks who don't want competition, um, but they do want to get a, a, a foot in the door to try to help um, some of these banks make loans to a broader group, marginalized communities for other goods, for other, uh, for other pro things like affordable housing and so forth. Um, and so it's a way of get, getting allies among uh, the, the, the banks. In my view, um, it would be much better to get the political support from workers, from people in the community, to have full-fledged uh, public banks in these. And I, th and I think California is really trying to do that. I don't think California is, is um, adopting 100% uh, this partnership bank model. And I, I'm hoping that they're going to be the new model for other banks around the country. Okay, Tom Mitch, I think Tom Mitch asked, what is, what is a bank? It seems we have a shadow banking system and depositories are just one element. Why do you think putting the toothpaste back in the tube is restoring Glass-Steagall, uh, back in the tube by restoring Glass-Steagall will restore stability. Dealers are now part of BHCs and subject to Big Vessel Three. So just one second of, of paraphrasing the question then, which was uh, that uh, it was a question about uh, the uh, prevalence and extent of non-banks in the financial system now and some of the ways in which they're intertwined with banks and a question about maybe the limitations of, of restoring Glass-Steagall as an approach given uh, that situation. Yeah, so um, I, I agree with some of the points that are implicit in that question. That is, yes, the so-called shadow banking system, the, the hedge funds, the asset managers, the dealers and so forth are becoming more and more part of, of the R and the global financial system. And you might've noticed that in the quick list of reforms that I proposed, it included uh, monitoring and regulation over, over all financial institutions. Um, the idea of the, glass, the new Glass-Steagall, and we can call it anything else you want, is I think we need to reduce the size of the mega banks, the, reduce the size of the holding companies. They're too big to regulate. They're too big to fail. Uh, they're, they're too big to, to jail. Um, they're too big to manage. And they have too much political power. We have to cut, figure out a way uh, to cut them down to size, to break them up. Um, and maybe the uh, Glass-Steagall Act, a new Glass-Steagall Act isn't the right way to put it, but we can put up asset limits, size limits, <clears throat> we, um, more restrictions on proprietary trading, which we tried to do with Dodd-Frank, <clears throat> um, restrictions on interconnections with other financial institutions and so forth. But uh, we have to break up <clears throat> these agglomerations of, of vast political and economic power that are represented in the, in the mega banks. Another question in the room? Um. <clears throat> I just want to go back to something someone <coughs> asked early on about progressives' um, um, perspective on, on what you're talking about. 
And I thought there was an implicit suggestion that uh, why aren't this is an election year, why aren't progressives putting forward a candidate for president uh, who would back these kinds of things? And uh, what should progressives be doing in the upcoming presidential election? Okay, there are people in this room who know a lot more about this than I do, and I would welcome any of them <laughs> to speak <laughs> to speak up. <laughs> However, I will say, I will say this. Um, Sure, I'm sorry. So the, the question returned to a, a theme earlier about what progressives ought to do and um, whether uh, it, in, in the context of the presidential election, why, why weren't uh, people suggesting a candidate to carry forward this particular focus um, and what the, the needs and opportunities are? Okay. Well, this is a nonpartisan event, so I don't, you can tell me what I can say, what I can't. But I will say that the current administration um, has drawn a lot of regulators and staff people from the club busters, from people who over the years have worked with Americans for Financial Reform, IPS, EPI, Better Markets, and so forth. People who are now um, in power in these regulatory agencies uh, who take very seriously these issues and um, have been trying to, to make a, a real difference uh, on them. Uh, some of the uh, some of the people who should have been um, accepted as, as heads of regulatory agencies, like for the OCC and places like that, uh, were, were denied for political reasons. Uh, so uh, in the next administration, they'll have to push even harder to get some of these people in place. But I think um, it's safe to say that we do have candidates. Uh, I've, I mentioned some of them earlier, and, and, and this administration they really are trying to take some of these issues seriously. But as Roosevelt told, uh, I think, to the, uh, the labor unions, they said, if you want me to do something, make me. If you want me to do something, push me. The same is true of any presidential administration. Um, the club busters are pushing them or trying to get them to do even more. Um, but I think we do have a number of people in government and in this administration really are who taking on are taking on a number of these important issues. John? Yeah, yeah. No one else, just yeah. a question. Yeah. Oh, go, okay. go for it. Okay, there's uh, one from Naha Sin. Um, in fact, two from <laughs> Naha Sin. Is that all right? So I'll ask them back to back. Uh, um, number one, how can we structure management and board teams for public banks to ensure the balance between community representation and financial expertise with excluding tra traditional bankers from the equation? Um, number two is in light of escalating bank consolidation and the strain on CDFI margins due to high interest rates, is there a political opportunity for the establishment of local and state public banks to expect public banks to, to garner bipartisan support? So two, two questions, uh, one about governance at public banks and how, um, how to put together uh, boards that will do what you want the goals of those institutions to be, uh, especially how do you think about uh, traditional bankers as members or not members of those boards? Uh, and secondly, about whether uh, present circumstances, including both increasing co consolidation of large banks and uh, pressure on the margins at uh, community development financial institutions uh, due to high interest rates, among other things, uh, create uh, opportunities to build increased support for public banks as alternatives. So let me take the second one first. Yes, definitely. I think that's one of the beauties of the partnership mar uh, model, which is, I said, public banks on a lend to community development financial institutions and other smaller banks at, at lower cost rates and helps them with their margins, allows them to survive and thrive and, and on lend uh, to final customers. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the governance structure for, for public banks, this is something that uh, all the public act, um, activists that, that I've spoken to, and he, again here, uh, former graduate student, Esther Nurugulu 
did a whole survey of the bank, public banking movement here in the United States. And, and she mostly, but I also, to some extent, talked to a number of these people um, about these issues. Um, they've all thought very deeply about how to construct a board that is both reflective of their communities, uh, that is responsive to um, stakeholders in their communities, but at the same time, um, have oversight uh, from, uh, for example, the state, if the state's putting funds into this bank uh, to, to make sure that um, everything is above board and um, that they have expertise. And I think it's a myth to think that there aren't bankers out there who want to work for a public institution um, who might be willing to take a lower salary than they can get in a mega bank who are quite competent um, and, and see this as a calling. You know, many of most of us don't get paid a huge amount of money for what we do. We see what, a lot of what we do as a calling, and I'm sure there are bankers like that as well. Uh, so I think we can have the expertise. We can have um, the, uh, the, the input of the community and stakeholders, while at the same time um, having uh, oversight that makes sure that everything is done uh, in an efficient and above board manner. And uh, as I said, this is something that all of these groups have thought a lot about as they're developing their, their programs. Thanks. Yeah, just to, I can ask it up here just so to yeah. say, please. <laughs> One of them that jumped out at me just in thinking also about power building and the uh, bust the bank circle is you talked about how, yeah, 75 years ago, FDR could team up with people who were actually building the economy, uh, non-financial people, and use their power to go against the banks. And you, your main reason for why this has fallen apart 75 years later is these horrible CEOs that both left and right hate and think have too much money, too much power. But you made, I'm just curious what this was based on, sort of an assertion that some of these CEOs, since their money is now so wrapped up in the financial system, are putting their own self-interest, shocking, over their corporations. And I guess my question, their own corporations, is aren't their, corp most of these corporations are incorporated as for-profit corporations in Delaware. Their charters, if I'm not mistaken, require them to maximize the profits of their firms um, above anybody's self-interest. So could there be a shareholder revolt to get rid of these guys because they are putting their self-interest above what is required of them from their charters? And and I am, I just, did you have an example of somebody, if you will, because I mean, I'm not saying we want to turn these people into our ally. I don't think they'll ever join Lisa and Dennis, <laughs> I don't know, maybe they will, you know, CEOs of big industrial firms. Um, but it feels like if, if they truly, if there's evidence that they're doing that, that um, they could be brought down. So, um, no, I can't name names and I, 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 I can't provide specific evidence. But what I can say is, first of all, one of the things that you said about our corporations required by their charter or by law um, to maximize shareholder value. This is one of the, the uh, um, bankers, one of the major tenets of Bankers Club economics, the idea that all corporations, at least in the United States, are required to maximize shareholder value. Well, um, as far as I understand, that is not really true. Lynn Stout, who's a terrific uh, legal Form, unfortunately, she's dead now, but a, a great legal analyst showed that corporations, the way they're incorporated, the way corporate law works here, and again, we have corporate lawyers here who could answer this better than I, um, doesn't say anything about maximizing shareholder value, that a corporation is not owned really by the shareholders. It's a corporate, a corporate entity that has many stakeholders, and that in principle, a corporation is supposed to um, act to some extent uh, in the interests of it of its of its stakeholders, so that's that's point number one. Point number two, I think it would be very difficult to prove um, that um, by refusing to align with better markets or Americans for financial reform that, they, that these these CEOs are uh, not acting in in their corporations' interests. However, 
I do think it's the case that if we're looking around for allies, and again, there are other people here who know more about this than I do, there are many uh, small banks, small business people, people who uh, really aren't that involved in, in politics. These big organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, and I think I learned this from Dennis, you know, they're run by the big, the big mega banks, the big mega corporations, often not in the interests of these smaller banks or the small business people and so forth. So there are many allies, and I'm sure you all have tried to get them, uh, among these these groups that could join uh, the, the club busters and maybe do on occasion. On occasion, but I think it would be hard to prove that uh, financial regulation is um, in the interest of the shareholders. I think it would be pretty easy to prove, though, that certain kinds of financial regulation is in the interest of many corporations writ, writ large, and if we include stakeholders. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, we will uh, end here. And oh, one more question. OK, we won't then. There's also a comment in the chat. Andy Morrison. I don't know. Andy Morrison says, thank you. We love the book at the this is kind of another book, though. Maybe I should. Um, we love the book at the New Economy Project, the key, a key aspect of the, of the partnership model of public banking as we as we envision it in New York, is the public banks would prior is the public banks would prioritize partnerships with our robust network of community development financial institutions (CDFIs), which have a social justice mission to to responsibly serve and build wealth and redlined. You don't have to repeat this; they can hear me. Uh, and redlined neighborhoods. So it not only so it's not only a matter of assuaging the commercial banking lobby, though that of course remains a major robot. Read more, I think has more information on Century uh, something, and then the the book I guess is the new economy impact of a new New York City bank, uh, public bank. Anyway, the the quest this other question is from uh, Gregory Squires. He asked the question before. He said, you didn't mention the Community Investment Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of similar rules. Are these helpful tools? And particularly, what do you think about the recent CRA reform? Okay. So uh, the CRA reform, what do I think of the recent CRA reform? Um, good. <laughs> it's definitely a step in the right direction. And it... Um, has, has really updated the CRA. Of course, the Bankers Club uh, pro protested vociferously against it and is still fighting it, but um, it has added many more tools to the toolkit uh, that advocates for community development and um, fair housing can use. So um, I, I'm a big supporter and people in this room uh, helped make that, make, help make that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone who listened online and to everyone in the room. Uh, congratulations again. And I believe there are books outside. <laughs>